Hi everyone, good evening. Um, welcome to the Sisters Interview. I'm Ritzkin and my co-host is my sister Ashaxi. And tonight we are very um, honored to have Her Excellency jean Vieve Chou, um, who is a court baroness in Antier and a mover and shaker in our DEI movement. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, I, I really appreciate you coming on. I'm, I'm super excited to talk to you. Um, so you know um, that we usually start these with your SCA origin story. So if you want to start there, that would be great. <laughs> so about five years ago, um, I started dating this wonderful woman. And after a short period of time, she disclosed, hey, I, I do this geeky thing. I'm like, what does that mean? She goes, well, I do reenactment. The first thing that popped into my mind was the movie Role Models. And I was like, I don't know about this. Like, this is, <laughs> this is something else. And it wasn't too long after that that she then told me she was stepping into um, the role of Baroness. Oh. So not only am I, have I been thrown into this, she is stepping up. And I have to step up, or I wanted to step up as a supportive um, person. Prior to this, my only experience with SCA people was I went to a birthday party of hers, and there must have been 20 people around the table. And she's introducing me to these people and telling me their names and their SCA names. Oh, no. And I'm like, I, I don't know how to handle this. Like, this is a little overwhelming. I'm not going to remember your real names, let, it know, let alone your SCA names. So it was a really fast movement into the society. Um, you know, I dove in head first. Um, like I said, she had stepped into the Baroness role. So I was both learning about the SCA and doing the SCA at, at the same time. Um, I think the, the benefits of having met some of her friends at the time, I didn't know about peerages. Like they didn't make sense to me. I didn't, she didn't really explain them to me. So I met all of these folks just in our mundane kind of real life. And then I later found out like they're Uber peers and they're all these important people with all these titles. And it was, I had a different experience with that because by then they were just, you know, X, Y, Z. And I think that helped my transition in to be much more comfortable. That to me feels like a much healthier way to um, meet people on, on kind of an even level. Um, I'm glad that that happened that way for you. <laughs> no, it was, it was really helpful. I didn't have the peer fear at that time, <laughs> now that I've been playing for a bit, <laughs> no, um, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of fantastic people without feeling like I would be judged for the quality of my work or um, because I didn't have status, I didn't have rank. And so it was really a great experience, not to mention that I started in Terra Primaria. And I know Terra Primaria is our little small group, but it's one of the most diverse places, I would say, in Ontier. Now, I haven't traveled all of Ontier, but we have LGBTQ representation. We have folks um, with neurodivergent. Um, we are very family oriented. So it really is just this culture of growth and learning and kindness that I've really come to value. And, and there, a big part of why I stayed was the people in TP who will drop everything on a dime to come help you move um, or do anything. So it's, it's, it was a wonderful transition and I, I feel very lucky for that. It must have been really hard though, um, coming in with uh, Lindis or yeah, Lindis mm -hmm. stepping up as a uh, Baroness because she's busy at these events. Um, so what did you do to, to sort of entrench yourself or, or to find something that you liked? Oh, 
I was just as busy supporting her. Um, it, it was, you know, making the necklaces for the awards. I did a lot of Scribble in the beginning, um, really took to Scribble, hadn't really painted very much um, and just found this state of comfort within Scribble. So I did a bunch of that. I started learning the fiber arts um, and that was phenomenal. Uh, had a lot of teachers on that. So, you know, even with learning the fiber arts, I learned to weave terrapameria patterns. So those could go into awards. Um, did a lot of uh, helping with making sure the Baron and Baroness, so Baron Whalen, uh, that they were hydrated and had food, um, you know, really just helping on the sideline and behind the scenes. I kept myself pretty busy because, yeah, Lynn was busy all the time. I also had the opportunity to play buffer role and be the, hey, you have this thing that needs to happen and we need to head over that way. And because I was her partner, I was better able to read her face and kind of step in and navigate that. So I think it was, it was a great experience. I will say that at the end of year two, I was done. <laughs> I was like, you need to step down. This is too much. <laughs> when is this over? When can we have a life again? Um, but it was great. It's a, uh, People often say that um, being royalty in the SCA is a true test of a relationship and that it either brings you closer together or it rips you apart. And you were a, a very new relationship going into this. Um, and uh, it's very impressive that the two of you were able to na navigate that. And um, I feel like maybe it gave you a really good foundation for years to come. I don't know. How do you feel about that? <laughs> no, absolutely. I think it was, we have a lot of similar similarities, some similar interests. We're both mental health therapists. So that absolutely helps. Although <laughs> there are times when I'm like, don't therapize me. <laughs> We're not going down that way right now. Um, but it has, it, it did help because we were spending so much time together. And at the same time, I was discovering my path. Um, I will say though, the first time setting up the pavilion, I was like, I'm done. Like she had the huge pavilion, all these poles that had to go places, stakes that had to be driven. And she, she needed it a particular way. And of course that wasn't anything I knew about. <laughs> so there were definitely like squabbles about um, how to set up a tent, <laughs> but you know. <laughs> the trial of a relationship setting up and tearing down um camp um, yeah. yes and when you aren't you used to like glamping um medievally um it's a lot of stuff and you're just like really <laughs> I mean, get a shower and a shower tent right what is happening right <laughs> we had the four poster bed so with the full wood frame that connected, that was warped and never correct, never uh, connected properly. So that was always a piece. I'm like, I just want to sleep on the ground. Let's get rid of this bed. Um, you know, had the table, had the whole setup. And there were times where I was like, I just want to put everything in the tent so we can lug half the stuff and not have to, you know, make appearances. Just like throw our stuff under the bed and be good. And there is something to be said about period encampment, encampments and waking up. That was one of my favorite thing about events is waking up and looking out and seeing, being transported to this other time. Um, it was really exciting and really when it was quiet, that was one of my favorite moments. And now that I've had back surgery, I basically said, uh-uh, this is not happening anymore. <laughs> I cannot set this up. We need to find something easier. Um, so we ended up with the RV a little early, but uh, I, would, I would rather sacrifice the period encampment for uh, a nice bed that I won't wake up 
needing painkillers for. <laughs> I am a hundred percent there with you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and it's probably a good thing that you, uh, had a bed from the beginning. Um, we have always slept on the ground <laughs> and there was an Ontario West war where I woke up with a vole burrowing into the back of my hair right oh, no. now. <laughs> and I like reach back and it, I just have a handful of fur. <laughs> awful. Oh, so awful. <laughs> so, I can't even imagine. <laughs> it learned to fly. <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. <laughs> It's a natural reaction. <laughs> <God>! <laughs> Be free <laughs> away from me. Do you guys um, do you like a day shade or something? Or do you have a household that does that? Do you have like a place um, that isn't in RV camping that you sort of have your home away from home? We have, so we haven't taken the RV to events yet. Oh, okay. um, we will absolutely have a day shade and find a place. I know that, you know, uh, like Camp Trouble, we'll go hang out with them when there's Camp Trouble, right? So I think there's, we will still make sure that it feels like we are at the event. I am also, I have a lot of social anxiety and so often need a quiet place. And the pavilions are always awfully hot like there is no, I do not want to lay down because I'm you know in garb and everything's sticking to me so the RV will be a nice place for me to just get away and have full privacy so it's it's kind of that twofold of I need a bed that's not going to hurt my back and I have to have a quiet space but it, but we do want to make sure that we are not you know staying in the RV we want to still be part of the experience so we will make it whatever we can yeah i just asked because it i sometimes it's hard to balance um what you need for your health um and your your mental and physical well-being um with feeling like you're part of the event um i know i struggle with that quite a bit it is a difficult decision and lynn has had you know her pavilion for like 20 years and so it really was not easy. We had talked about, you know, keeping the pavilion and getting cots, um, a whole bunch of options. And then in the end, we had a dear friend who was looking for a pavilion. And it just so happened that we were able to give them all of our, you know, setup, um, you know, keeping some of the items. But it, it just wasn't going to be feasible. Um, and so we, we worked around it, but I really told her, I was like, I can't do setup. And while before me, you know, she set up on her own, no problem. You know, as you get older, <laughs> it becomes a little more difficult. And so, you know, it just, it wasn't in the cards anymore. And it, it was, it really was a difficult decision because I do like being in, like I said, walking out in the morning and seeing, being transported back in time. Yeah. So it's going to be different and it's going to take a change, but I think my back won't do it anymore. There's no option. Well, and I think that there are um, a lot of uh, people that are making that same transition as we go back. So I think that you're going to be in good company and uh, that there will be, uh, it, it will happen. There will be a place that's like an RV campers hangout, you know, day shade thing, or, you know, there will still be people camping. I think, I think it'll all work out. And uh, I think you guys will be still feel totally included and, and all of that. So I'm excited for you because whatever makes it so that um, it's easier to play, I think is what's right. Yeah, and so for me, the most difficult part about events besides the setup and tear down, um, and even after that, we got into a routine. It really was the, the anxiety and needing space. 
um, that never quite, it, it never quite goes away. And so being around so many people for so long, it's really draining. I'm very much an introvert. Um, and, you know, it takes me days, right? Like it takes me days after events to recover. So I'm hoping this will help with some of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, that's part of why I cling to our year so firmly because it, it stays cool and I can close the door and it feels like it's my own space and people don't invade it. Um, and I need that. I need to just shut everything down. So I'm going to pivot us a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry, I kind of got us on a tangent. No, that's okay. Um, uh, the Baron of Terra Primaria just sent me a picture of uh, his daughter in an outfit that you made. And it, it um, made me realize that I didn't ask you what was your first garb and, and how did that come around? And um, tell me about that. My first garb, uh, because it was so close, we didn't have a whole lot of time for me to prepare for the first event, which was Eggles. Um, my, uh, our dear friend, Alexis came and her, her and her mom helped with the garb, the first two pieces. Um, I had never sewn a stitch in my life. So it was, we just need to get this whipped out. So she has something to wear to the event. Um, my first garb was a green under tunic. And that is when I learned I hate hand sewing, like with a passion. <laughs> my hands cramp. <laughs> I just can't like handle holding it for so long. Um, but after that, you know, I made a lot of, well, I made the rest of the garb that I have. Um, I am not the most comfortable with making garb for other folks. Um, the garb I made for the Baron's daughter was very simple. Um, and I did hand finish everything, but it, it was so simple that it, I felt comfortable doing it. Um, I didn't have to worry about it being too small. And we got to embellish it a little bit. And as a child, <laughs> a rambunctious child, we uh, definitely made sure that it would outlast any uh, events with mud or dirt <laughs> or grass and rolling around. Um, so it was great. It was actually uh, really a really nice feeling to see someone step up in your creation, as I'm sure you know, right? Like. Yeah, Bar Baroness Lindis has this beautiful piece, you know, and I was telling you earlier, I was going to wear it because it's in a shoxy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's beautiful, but it somehow felt a little sacrilege. Like that's, that's her step up garb. Um, and so I decided to, to do a little more authentic French and, you know, but it's memorable. Those things are memorable. Yeah, for sure. Um, did you find a mentor with your arts early on? Yes. Uh, Suvia is my peer. Um, not that she's, I'm sure she's not disappointed in me, but the, the last few years have, have definitely turned more into service. Um, and I, I think that even in doing the scribal work, I've been more service oriented in a lot of ways. I think that's just an extension of what I do for a living, right? My, my job, my passion is helping others who are less fortunate, people from communities that often experience inequity the most. And so I just started towards, you know, gravitating towards opportunities to give back to the community. So I had, I was able to run, co-run an event um, for Terra Primaria, so small event. So kind of dipped my toes in that one. Um, and then had the opportunity under an adesha to co-run gate for Ontario West for. And uh, my cashier days, my younger days definitely <laughs> came in handy because uh, you know, it was like I had stations set up and it was very like, 
you're going to go here and then you're going to go here and you're going to do this thing and we're going to get you moving in, in and out and uh, had a lot of good feedback from that. And so, you know, I had to like to run an event at some point um, when life is not as busy as it is. Yeah. But yeah, the, you know, I really, in talking with Suvia, I really want to do some work around psychology and treatments in medieval history. Um, I think it would just be fascinating to see how what I'm currently practicing looked in medieval days. Um, and there's plenty of literature out there. It's just a matter of sitting down and doing the thing. Um, I also have aspirations to do an entire outfit all hand sewn. That's going to be like years from now. <laughs> but, well, you know. and, and since you said that your hands cramp, there is a, a tool, I think it's called a third hand that's made to hold things while you sew it. Um, I know Kalja has one. I've never Here's had one. Nico. Yeah, so um, that might help with the hand cramping, so. And, and as you, um, obviously, you know this as an artist, um, as you get more comfortable with it, you relax a little bit too. So I have the same problem with metal work and leather work. Like I hate it because my hands hurt and I, I think it's because I'm uncomfortable, but yeah. yeah. It definitely is. I think one of my big, one of the things that I'm working through is it doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to have every perfect stitch. Um, but that is contrary to how I work in real life. Uh, I guess just in general sometimes. Um, and so I think when I'm just trying to make sure that the stitches are even and evenly spaced and perfectly straight, I I'm doing a lot of work <laughs> that's pretty unnecessary. <laughs> And I just need to find some ways to, uh, you know, make it fun again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you do everything perfect now, you don't have any room to grow. You know, I, I still wear a brown tunic on these interviews that was like, I don't know, my first five years. And it's got applique triangles on it and the blanket stitches are all like whoop, 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 whoop. and they're 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 just horrible. But it's it's lasted. <laughs> and nobody notices it but you. Nope. Maybe, nobody maybe, knows. Maybe losing. Well, <laughs> Lynn Lynn said one time, she said, if someone is that close to you to be able to see the stitches in your garb. There's something wrong with that. <laughs> so, so I've at least gone to the, how does it look from, you know, this distance? <laughs> so when you were talking about your scribal, um, you said that you didn't have a lot of experience in the, the illumination part, but did you do calligraphy before? Not at all. I still don't. I want to learn. That's my ne next step. Um, I've done scribal for the kingdom, principality, and the barony. Um, I've actually done some work for other kingdoms. I would like to learn calligraphy. It, it's, it's something that I aspire to. I also think when, I, when I've been a part or, or watched some of the discussions online that we really want to start paying attention to hack hands and, and using authentic script and authentic language as we're doing these, um, which is hard. You have to, you have to have knowledge of the language, knowledge, knowledge of the hand, but I am definitely interested in doing that. Uh, what that will look like, I have no clue. Um, you know, I do a lot of self-teaching because classes give me a lot of anxiety or finding someone who can work with me one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and that just, I haven't done yet. I would love to be able to create a scroll from, you know, research all the way through the calligraphy. Um, and I've done some 
So I've done some research and I've worked with creating the design. It really is the calligraphy is the last step. Tracing, I'd really love tracing, to yeah. <clears throat> I, I, uh, the um, Heloise who I, from Artemisia, who I interviewed last night, um, that's one of the things she does. And she talks about how she taught herself how to do different hands just through tracing over and over and over again. So <laughs> I have a couple books, um, you know, in the beginning, everybody does what looks pretty you know, what looks good, as authentic as possible. Um, it's, a, it's a learned craft to extend it to the research and have the hands that would have been period. Um, it's, but that's a lot of work. And oftentimes, you know, we get a scroll that's ordered a week before an event <laughs> and we need to put together and at that point, it's just, let, let's get it done and just make sure it looks nice. Although my first charter was such a bomb. Like it was so awful. <laughs> um, I wasn't familiar with uh, the pigments at the time. And so I put it on really heavy and they started to crack and I couldn't, I couldn't bring myself to turn it in. It was like, this is, this is still in my stash. I have it <laughs> to remind myself of that far I've come. But I was like, no way, I'm not turning this in. I can't do that. <laughs> and that's why we have the charter system. And that's what's so beautiful about it is that it's built so that you can make mistakes and, and you can fail and it's not, um, it's not a disaster. <laughs> in Terra Pomeria, we have... I mean, there's so many artists um, in terms of scribal work. And so I've been able to learn from them. They are very willing to sit down with me when we have scribal night to talk about shading or talk about what would and would not be period. Um, so I had a lot of teachers in that and, and people who are really passionate about the work. So that was fine. Um, I was deputy scribe for a bit when someone had to go out and on some medical leave. And that was fun. I like to do the organizing and spreadsheets and do the thing. Uh, but I hate the meetings. I was always so bad at the meetings <laughs> because I'm in work all day with meetings. And then to drive somewhere to meetings is difficult. Um, I'm really hoping that a lot of meetings are virtual. You have, not only is that more accessible, um, you're able to reach a wider audience and really help involve larger groups of folks. Uh, and I know the Barony is talking about doing, our Barony of TP is talking about doing virtual and I think we should all do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Our, uh, my local Barony has been having virtual meetings but they're Wednesday nights uh, during interviews. So <laughs> I've never been to one because I can't. <laughs> so, um, so how did you uh, get involved in uh, DEI work within the SCA? So I didn't know that there was a DEI council at the time. Um, what really happened is, so I do, I mean, that is my mundane job is DEI work. Um, anti-racism work, really looking at how to change the system for Oregonians. And I remember hearing about this diversity committee and I reached out, or Zoe reached out, I believe. Um, um, sorry, Kiva. That just Kiva. <laughs> just Kiva. <laughs> uh, reached out to me and connected me and helped me get on the committee. And I was very passionate about the work. Um, when I stepped in, one of the first things that we had to accomplish was 12th night um, fallout. So this was after the double tree incident and we were having 12th night at the double tree. So myself and the autocrats went to meet with the double tree and to really lay out like, here are the expectations for this event in order for people to feel safe. And that is not guaranteeing that people will, will come. 
but we offered, you know, rooms, we offered meeting times for folks to come sit and just talk with us. Um, we printed out some kind of guides to the event to help people get through the event. We did some awareness. So we had our own table where we were passing out um, little orange ribbons and just some information to really get in there. And that felt like my mundane work. That That is where I think my, my passion really came alive because um, I had some wonderful discussions at that 12th night. Um, and so after that, I was just really hooked. When that committee sunsetted, I asked the crown if I could do interim work because I didn't, I was, I was afraid that the, the new committee would go away if nobody was paying attention. Um, and so Shea and Kierton were sitting thrones and I, you know, made sure that I could get in. We established new protocol for new membership and, and how to make sure that we have really diverse members on the committee. And then from there, it just kind of went like clockwork. Um, I stepped down when, <laughs> because I was going into surgery and I was like, this isn't gonna happen. Like first the pain has taken over my life and uh, I'm not gonna be in any sort of state to do this work. Um, so, you know, I'm still a member, still a general member on the committee. Um, one of the things that I've been working on with Atia or Seneschal has been a review of Atia Kingdom laws and looking for areas of improvement where we can either insert DEI values um, or just put in simply some language to start building that into the culture of Atia. So I absolutely have, I have plenty of projects to work <laughs> on, <laughs> but it really is, it, it's my passion. And, and so it's, I've fallen a, away a bit from the craft that I love to do work that I'm really passionate about. And I feel very fortunate for that. Well, I think we're really fortunate to, to have you and I'm really thankful for all of the work you're doing. And it, it sort of feels like uh, it, your um, SCA experience has been, welcome to the SCA, now get to work. <laughs> Help, you know, fix us, please. Um, and I, I wonder how you feel about that. And, and there's a lot of feels there. <laughs> um, you know, I, I go back and forth about being a person of color and doing the education when we really want to encourage people to do self-education and awareness. And for a lot of people, you know, being in Oregon, uh, which is majority white, um, it was very hard to connect with people who knew the DEI work as well. And it just so happened that I connected with Baroness Zara and Giada, um, who are also doing DEI work. And so building that, building that support structure was really, really helpful. I think those connections, knowing that we were both experiencing similar barriers helped keep me moving forward. And then I had a support group. Mm -hmm. um, it is very difficult to find, I mean, so not only Oregon, I'm in Salem. So I rarely see a person of color, uh, encounter a person of color. And uh, this helped me feel like I found an affinity space. And that is where we can heal together and listen together and really make the work move forward, knowing that our jobs and we've chosen, our chosen jobs are to advance DEI work. Um, so while I am a person of color doing that, I often think to myself, if I don't, who will? And so I've been teaching a lot of the bystander classes 
Um, I just had a request from Avacol. So I thought I was uh, I done for a little bit and I got a contact for July. And, you know, if people and they requested it because of something on one of your shows. So, you know, if people want this, I feel like I'm going to provide it because the more people who know and are talking about it, the further it can spread. Yeah. My my mission right now is to um, do a bystander train the trainer because I know that I cannot continue to teach these courses at work and then teach them for the SCA because even classes take a lot out of me. Um, and there are 29 people signed up for the train the trainer. Yeah. <laughs> So it? I was, I was not expecting those numbers. And even if only half of the folks go and teach it later, you know, that's, that's one more, two more, however many more than just myself. Yeah. And I, your goal as a teacher really is to make yourself obsolete. Mm -hmm. And, and you're overworked right now. And if there is a way that uh, I can and other people can spread that work and, su and support you at the same time, um, we need to be doing that. So I'm really uh, excited that um, you're going to provide that. And Rifkin wants to know when it is. because I, yeah, I want you to plug when it is and, and how people can find out about it. August 29th. It's a Sunday, the last Sunday in August, and it's from noon to four to hopefully accommodate folks' schedules from, you know, as far wide as possible. Um, but I do, I, right now I have folks from all over the known world, and it's been really exciting to see them come in, see these requests coming in. Um, and I know some of the folks on there, I know the majority of the folks who have signed up and have full faith and confidence that they will be able to take the material moving forward, make it their own and, and spread the word because we have to. Yeah. You know, at the last panel I sat on for LGBTQIA2S awareness, I said, we have to do something. We have an obligation to say something, do something, when we witness behavior that is inappropriate, um, that is harassment, that is bullying, we can't be passive bystanders anymore. It doesn't work. We know this because people leave the SCA. Um, people are unhappy and stop going to events and it creates a culture of fear and unease. And the way to combat that is to integrate bystander interventions into the culture, help people feel more comfortable calling someone in when they see it and educating and awareness. Um, now is the time to do it while we're all virtual. It can, there's some safe space to be able to have these difficult discussions and talk about it. Um, and I hope that they will continue. Yeah. Um, because it really has been, I've had a fantastic journey with this class. I think there is willingness to continue to participate, but I can't be everywhere at once. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And, and I know that, uh, there is a lot of, a lot of people have been doing a lot of processing as we've been away from being in person. And I know that there is a lot of frustration and anger that people are feeling. And um, I think it's important that we learn how to do bystander intervention in a way that isn't angry. <laughs> right. You know and so, you know, so I'm going to bring up something that <clears throat> I'm sure is going to be a source bar. Uh, uh, you can always stop me if I'm going down a wrong path. 
um, when trim gate happened, when the, when the incident with the trim happened, I remember thinking to myself, how many people saw that piece before it went out? And I've had several talks with Lindis about, you know, well, this, this symbol, you know, is known as something else and has different meaning in med medieval times. And my response was, I don't have the privilege to see it like that. I can't. I can't imagine weaving that without seeing it. If someone handed me a pattern, I'd be like, what are you talking about? Like, I'm not going to weave a swastika. Um, but it, it's my different experiences. So when, when that happened and people had these immense reactions and emotions because they've put their heart and soul into this and see the SCA as their home away from home, the community that they've built, um, people really took it hard. And unfortunately for myself, it was a, well, of course I see it. Like I saw it the moment I came in, like it's there as a person of color, as an LGBTQ person. Um, I've seen it since day one, but I'm also new and have the life experience I have to be able to see that and recognize it. And I think so many people didn't that it was so much of a shock that it took a lot of healing for folks. I had a lot of conversations with friends who were like, I can't make heads or tail of this. I don't know how I feel. You know, the world as I know it has stopped. And I'm sure that it felt like that. Um, and it, it, oh, go ahead. And there were multiple opportunities for bystander intervention. And I, I, I know that there's controversy around weaving. And again, I don't have that privilege of, of not seeing the, the, the swastika and not knowing what it is and having an association with it. Um, but there were so many times that someone should have intervened and that situation could have been avoided. And so it's things like that, that you know, can destroy someone's experience on the one hand, I'm grateful that folks had an opportunity to really start looking around themselves and really understand what, how bias and hate and microaggressions can present on a daily basis. And I still wish someone had intervened. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I have to say it was a, it was a big learning experience for a large part of the artistic community. Um, I have made several items with swastikas on them um, that were period recreations. And I recognize what that symbol is, um, but I didn't have an understanding of how hurtful it was. And the minute that I got that education. <laughs> um, there was no argument that was, nope, you know, because if something is that harmful to somebody and it's brought to my attention, there's no question. It's not going to be happening anymore. Um, and it's unfortunate that it had to be brought to my attention, <laughs> you know, and that it had to be brought to all of our attention. But that's, like you said, that's part of my privilege and that's part of what I need to remedy. I applaud you and sincerely applaud you for going back and you know doing the self uh, you know really taking a look at yourself. I have a friend who's a weaver who's a fantastic weaver and when that happened actually went to people who had trim with swastikas on it and said I will give you new trim, but I want to pull this back or I want to modify it in some way. Like I have huge respect for that. Yeah. I know there's still a part of the community that says, you know, but this is period 
And I'm like, our identities don't stop at the door as much as people, and I hate the phrase, leave the politics at the gate. Um, not possible. That's, that's not possible. It's absolutely not possible. And especially when these events happen. So another event, uh, when I was at Ontario West War working gate, uh, there was a swastika in the Biffy that hadn't been there before. And folks in my camp had seen it. And, and it was, again, nobody said anything. And at that point I was like, I'm done. I'm going in my camp. It's almost time for court. I just need to step away. Um, Lynn, her fabulous self went and talked to the people and were like, why didn't you say anything? And it's still just a learning experience, right? And it's, I, we have growing pains. We have a lot of work to do. And as long as there are people willing to do it, we can make change. It's a big system and we have to, in a lot of ways, operate within the system, which is frustrating. But when we talk about creating, creating change on a large scale that is systemic and sustainable, we have to work it into the current fabric until the current fabric no longer exists. But it's a lot. It, it is. And it's, it's a really steep learning curve for those of us that have not had an eye to this all along. And that's hard and people are resistant to it. And um, on the one hand, that's understandable. <laughs> On the other hand, that's really frustrating. So um, it's probably gonna take a lot longer than any of us would like it to, but I am seeing people really have a, a strong desire to start making those changes. And that's super hopeful and exciting for me. Absolutely. I you know, work in a large state system and change is glacial. You know, I'm used to the, well, today I'm going to do this one tiny thing. I'm also used to working off radar and, you know, putting together a presentation that leadership can't refuse and, and will have buy-in. And I know what uh, strategies to use for different groups, but change does not happen overnight. Um, I can be angry about it, and I often am, and often sad, but that doesn't help bring people in. Um, anger often makes people defensive and refuse to change, and that's not what, what we want. I've talked to Baroness Sara and Giada many, many times about this, and it's about bringing people alongside. Now, there are some who are repeat offenders. And if they've been educated and they've been made aware, um, then we need to directly deal with that. We need to stop excusing the behavior. Um, and I hear it a lot and there's power dynamics within it. There's a whole bunch of factors, but if we are silent, we are, we are accepting the behavior. And I think that's the hardest for folks to learn, especially when it's someone you know. But we have to do it. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's hard because the work often ends up, I mean, and this ties into what we were talking about with the swastikas, the work ends up on the people that have been harmed. And um, that's a really hard conundrum because I am not a person of color and I can never have a full understanding of what a person of color's experience is. And so I can't represent that. I can't, but there's a desire to make sure that things are better. And, and that the people of color aren't doing all the work. Yeah. And that would be helpful. I think I think it would it would start with having spaces for really candid conversations. 
Um, for people I know and trust, I'm willing to be an open book and talk about it. Um, if we had a group, you know, a white affinity group or a straight affinity group and talking about education awareness for that, we know that works. Um, people feel safer in uh, their, with people of the same identity and same background. Um, at work, we just realized, you know, we have these employee resource groups that are similar to affinity groups. Um, and we just realized we need a white affinity, affinity group because folks wanna come in and learn how to be an ally, but that's not what for that time is for. Um, so we're actually creating it with some high level sponsors. And sometimes that's what needs to happen. I especially experience, so what is happening in the SCA is just as what's happening in you know, the real world, we're a microcosm. Um, and so the information that I provide, you know, bystander intervention, for instance, uh, can often be better, better heard, better received from the audience by someone who they identify with. I see that in the mundane world too. Um, and I'm all for that. Not only do I not have to do the work, but if people will actually listen, that's what matters. Yep. That's, it's, that's one of the reasons why um, I've encouraged my husband to take that class with me because um, he's a white man. <laughs> and, and in some circles, uh, his voice will be listened to over all of our voices. Um, and I'm talking about within the SCA and like you said, it's a microcosm, despite the fact that my sister holds the same ranks that he does and, and, and more so. Um, and that's hugely frustrating. <laughs> and that's the framework we have to work in within. I'm really happy to see so many nights on the bystander train the training. Um, whether people realize it or not, I mean, that is our, our society is built around combat. Um, knights have a lot of influence. And so having those conversations in those circles where the change can be made in very apparent ways, I think will be helpful. Um, so I'm excited to see, I, you know, there are some people on there who are very passionate about DEI work and the more the merrier, you know, someone made the comment that all peers should take it. Uh, I would love for that to happen. I would love for it to be a requirement for any peer stepping up, anyone who will be, you know, sitting throne, royalty, baron, baronesses, offices, I mean, if I had my way, we'd all have this training. And <laughs> starting small, um, I hope we can at least get, get to the folks who really have a responsibility for being a model of, I'll just say chivalry, but being a, being a model to the rest of us. Yeah, I, you know, <sighs> we talk a lot about peer like qualities in the SCA and among the peer groups and um, what makes a leader and um, having these skills feels like it should, as you said, absolutely be minimum requirements for peer like qualities for sure. Um, so I feel like we need to get on it. <laughs> <laughs> One step at a time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, which circles us back around to things are slow. <laughs> I, will, I will fully admit sometimes I have no patience and I'm like, why are you doing this? We've had this conversation and, you know, it's, I work all day for DEI. I do DEI from home and then I'm sitting in the current state of the world, you know, watching 
watching what is happening to people that look like me and watching, you know, LGBTQ rights be questioned and all of these atrocities. And sometimes I, Lynn knows, I can't get out of bed. I'm like, I can't people, I can't do anything today. I need to shut down because I am feeling very hopeless. Um, There are less days than that right now. Um, but sometimes I'm just like, it's, it's DEI work 24 seven yeah, and I get tired. How could you not? I mean, I'm sure that this conversation that we're having is some, is a conversation that you've had probably hundreds of times. <laughs> no, I think that most people don't ask the questions that they want to, because they want to play it safe. Even though I've said, you know, you can ask me a question. I cannot guarantee that I'm not going to be activated and have a response, but we can have a respectful conversation. I think people's, people's first inclination is just not to have the conversations openly. And we need to start becoming comfortable with having these difficult conversations together. Um, and it's hard because we also need to create the culture. If, if someone comes and says, hey, what happened made me feel this way? We as the recipients need to be able to say, thank you for educating me. So we both need to have a culture of accepting or being able to give feedback for change as well as accept it because we're human we will all make mistakes. I make them every day at work and every day I have to be like, I am so sorry for that. I was, um, I, I commuted down to Portland and back yesterday and today, and I was listening to Brene Brown's, um, mm-hmm. um, oh, the, the gifts of imperfection. And she's mm-hmm. all about leaning into your discomfort. Um, and I just think that is such a powerful thing. Um, because when you do that, you actually subdue the, the angst, right? Because mm-hmm. you're dealing with it. Um, it. But it's a hard thing to do. And I, I get that it's a hard thing to do. But um, I, I just, I really liked that. So I think it's, it's, it feels so much better to do that than it does to carry that angst and to let it build and and impact your sleep. <laughs> and <laughs> because I think I, I'm not sure that people realize that it impacts your physical health, it impacts your mental health. Um, and it's something that you carry around every day. I train the trainer one of the first things I talk about with bias is we all have it and we have to start with that accepting place having bias does not we need to stop thinking of it as a binary good and bad it is our brains are hardwired and there's a whole bunch of psych- psychological principles behind it neurological physiological principles behind it we have biases and it's it's finding out what they are. And there's a couple different ways, but finding out what they are and addressing them. We need to stop thinking about if someone says X, Y, Z, well, they must be a bigot because that doesn't get us anywhere. We have to be willing to at least do the education and awareness. I will give grace the first time. After that, then we're going to have a completely different conversation, but we need to have those conversations. Um, People can't do better if they don't know how to do better. And it can be hard as a person of color to say like, wow, ouch, that hurt. Let me tell you why. Um, I'll give an example. For whatever reason, people like to touch my hair. Like when I have it curly and down, people just find it fascinating. And I'm not sure why, because I hate my curly hair, but um, there have been a couple people who have like pet me 
<laughs> and I've had to come back like without asking. And I've had to go back at, you know, and say, Hey, so this makes me feel like an animal at least ask. And I will still tell you no, because I'm a very, like my bubble is five feet. <laughs> I have a large bubble. Um, and like, here's how that makes me feel. Uh, I've had my hair yanked on by strangers in the mall when I would flat iron it to see if it was my real hair. Like there's some real trauma behind that. And people don't always realize like, it's just a small gesture. I want to feel how your hair is. Most people have never felt black hair, I guess. Um, but, but there's trauma behind that and having those conversations is helpful. For sure. For sure. Um, Oh, it's gone. I'm sorry. (laughs) I talk a lot. (laughs) Before you started that story. And, um, I, I think that's a really good, um, a good base, base story. You know what I mean? Like that, um, I was just going to say that, uh, one of the things I think, um, we have difficulty with in the SCA and in society in general is people hear words like privilege and bias and they immediately feel attacked Mm -hmm. and it's not an attack. It's, it's about acknowledging that your worldview is not the worldview. Um, and I feel like if we could just deescalate some of the language, and I think that comes through education. Um, I just think we would be so much less, um, there'd be less, uh, animosity, I think. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Yeah. And, it, and it's hard because, um, especially online, a lot of the words that, that we use in, in doing DEI work have been weaponized by people who don't want to see that work done. Um, and that's really, really unfortunate because it escalates that defensiveness and it ex- escalates that feeling of attack. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't have an answer or a solution to that. But <laughs> I mean, the, 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 the answer and the solution is education, I think, but the people have to be open to it. And I think that's the, the, the big obstacle is that the people that maybe really need to hear it aren't open to, to listening. Right. Those aren't the people that come to my classes, yeah. right? The people who come to my classes are wanting to either change or learn something new or what have you. The people that we need to reach are the ones who would never come to that class or would only come to that class to, uh, you know, stir the pot. Uh, and, and it is really difficult, especially when you, like, like you said, talk about privilege, because people automatically assume if you're that privilege means you've been handed everything and you haven't had a hard life. And that's not what privilege means at all. It just means that you've had, you haven't had the struggles that other cultures and other communities have had, but it's hard for folks to hear that. Um, I often get the well, yeah, I'm a white man, but I grew up poor and, and X, Y, Z. And I'm like, listen, it's not the oppression Olympics. This is about things that, that come with being a white man. Like I've been followed in stores. I've been chased in cars, you know, for doing, for driving down the road. Like we all have our stories. And as a white man, you are unlikely to have those same stories Um, and if you do, if you've had the opportunity to live in a place where you've been a minority, then that should open your eyes a little bit about how it feels and that should build compassion, but it doesn't always. And empathy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not about comparing our experiences. This is about acknowledging, um, the differences in, in having the compassion and the empathy to, um, relate or, yeah. Yeah. Good, good, good. So um, you are uh, starting to work on a project (laughs) 
that is uh, going to allow, um, give a platform for uh, people to talk about their stories. Um, do you wanna talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Um, so for those of you who were on my Facebook wondering what the big news was, um, it is that I will be launching a show called Voices of Color, um, Skadian Stories, where people of color can come and have some real talk about what it's like to be a person of color in the SCA. And it's not just about the SCA, right? It's about experiences that we have that translate to the SCA, you know, trauma that I may have or experience outside of the SCA and how it, it impacts me in the SCA. Um, for a very short period of time, I had a group that we were talking about historical trauma and how that plays a part in the SCA. But really what I want is, is a platform for people of color and I hope to have special editions where we can talk about um, intersectionality of inter identities. But I really want people to be authentic, to share experiences, to hopefully, hopefully help the folks who are watching build that empathy, build that understanding and build a connection because it's one thing for me to, you know, write down my story and put it out there. These are people behind those stories. Like you are looking at the folks who have had these experiences. There will be common themes, I'm sure, about being a person of color. Um, you know, they're just, there's, there hasn't been, to my knowledge, anything quite like it. Um, I think that if folks are expecting the, you know, happy-go-lucky, I'm sure there's going to be some of that, but it will be real talk. Um, you know, there will be some constraints. There will be no um, bigotry towards anyone. Like, that is just not acceptable. I don't care who you are. But I want people to, to really share and put out there their experiences when I first thought about the show, it really was, I want to collect these stories for people to see later. But then it was more about, I want us to share our stories similar as how you would an affinity group to know that you're not alone, to hear somebody that looks like you have a, the same or similar story. There's some power and healing in that. Um, and at the same time, I do want folks to be able to watch, you know, our, our white allies, to be able to watch and really hear and see what is happening and try to open up that lens. Um, my first, so the show starts July 6th. We are taking over the, which show? Uh, the Branch of Laurel's time slot. Branch of Laurel's, Laurel's time slot. Um, so the first one will be July 6th at 6th. And my first, uh, the first two people on will be Giada and Zara talking about what it's like to be a woman of color doing the DEI work. Um, and then the subsequent, they're going to help me as co-hosts. Because um, I do think it's important to have more than one person in an interview because, well, one, you can tag team, but it's gonna be some heavy material. So we're starting it every other week because I think that I will need a week to take a break and to heal and to you know, move forward and get ready for the next one. Um, Cause originally I wanted to do it each week, but I just, it's, it's not only taxing on your time, as I'm sure you both know, um, <laughs> it's a lot. It's just heavy subject material. Um, so I want to make sure that everybody involved has some self-care options afterwards. I'm, I'm booked through December. Wow. So I'm taking December off because I am just, that is that, that is some of the busiest times at work is December. And I was like, nope, we're all going to take a break. This is going to be a done. 
Uh, so I'm booked through September with a, another list to schedule. Um, so, I, you know, I think people want to have their stories done, even if it's just stories by us for us. There's just a lot of power in getting that out there. I'm super excited. I, I'm super excited too. And I'm excited to support you however I can with it. Um, you are going to be streaming that through, not through the sisters, um, but through your own um, Facebook page. But I will make sure to share it to the sisters page so that people can access it. Um, your page is not up and active yet. I tried to publish it and it said it wasn't published. Um, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. <laughs> but I did, you know, I, I did want to thank you for the work that you've done already um, in helping me get set up and feel more comfortable. I don't think I could possibly prepare for what may come and what subject matter will come up, um, but I'll have, you know, a support person there. And now with uh, your suggestions, I, I have a better idea of how to make it run more smoothly. Um, you know, as, as you talked about, it's going to be a, a launch and learn. Yeah. Um, so it'll, it'll be a great experience. And, and that's also partially why I wanted to do the train the trainer was so I could focus on this. Yeah. It's, it's just something that I woke up one morning and I was like, we need to do this. It, and part of it's because I've watched uh, interviews or panels that have kind of dipped their toe in talking about race and then really pulled back. And some of it's because it's hard to find um, people of color who, without tokenizing, and at the same time, when we just kind of dip a toe in, that's not helpful. Um, and this will be full experience, full immersion of what it's like to be a person of color in and outside of the SCA. And, and we've really struggled with that with our interviews um you know not tokenizing but still wanting to make sure that there's um diversity represented and um honestly as white women we can't do what you're doing we just can't and so to be able to support you <laughs> and help you help make you uh help you be successful in this is is a gift to to, to, to us. So thank you for, for uh, trusting us to, to help you out. Um, do you want to uh, screen share the um, yes. picture of the group? So, so once we get it up and I'll try to get it uh, in the next couple of days, I'll try to try to, I don't know what your schedule is, but we'll try to get it fixed. So I really wanted something. So the brand and the logo really is that voices of color skating and stories. Um, so some of even the train the trainer work and other work, I've been putting that on there to really help promote and create uh, space for this. Um, and then, you know, I found this really cool graphic about skin tones and <laughs> I just like the background. I think within people think of people of color as, you know, being visible people of color. And that's not always the case one. Um, there is some truth in colorism. So darker skinned people tend to have it more difficult than lighter skinned. And for, for many reasons that, you know, I won't go into, but, you know, people of color come in a range just as anyone else and making sure that folks realize that it's it's not just, uh, you know, going to be a, a, a Black people. It's going to be anyone who identifies as people of color. Um, I advertised on the Skadians of Color website and just kept getting hit after hit. And I think some, I know some people are waiting to see what the show will be like. Yeah. Because it's, I'm still waiting <laughs> to see what the show will be like. Um but there are, there's interests and there's something cathartic and healing about being able to tell your story. So I'm, I really, truly am excited. I feel really passionate about this work. 
I of course have other projects that I simultaneously want to do. Um, <laughs> Lynn, Lynn and I have talked about the grievance policy and making it more trauma informed um, and easy to use that doesn't re-victimize the target. But uh, this really, I think for the next few months will be my project. And I'm very fortunate that Zara and Giada have agreed to co-host. I, I have not um, met either of them yet, but I have been a big admirer from afar. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. Fabulous, fabulous people. And we get along. We, we have very, I would say, laid back personalities in a lot of way. We understand that the work is going to be long and hard. We have our difficult days where we'll be like, girls, I need a drink. Let's have a Zoom call. Um, and I think this will be helpful too, to really get an understanding of what people of color are experiencing because we're so isolated. Um, and, and, and continue to build community. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's gonna be great. Um, if you wanna stop screen sharing, we can uh, share the photos that I pulled of <laughs> uh, your SCA journey. So Lynn has been my rock. I mean, not only does she get me into this, but anytime I need some support in and out of the SCA, she's been there. But really for the SCA, she's helped me build confidence in the work that I'm doing and myself as a person. It's just amazing. Yay. Yeah. This was, so this was my first piece of what I wanted to be pretty garb. <laughs> and I did make all of that. It was for 12th night. It was a last minute. Like, I mean, the week before, and I was like, I have to have something pretty as, you know, several of us do. Um, so I pulled out the fabric, started getting ready, cut all the pieces and the pattern was upside down. Oh. So <laughs> I was like, I can't do this. And of course, Lynn came in and, and helped me figure it out and we got it all together. Um, but I had sections I had to go back and sew that, that hadn't been done, but I loved it. I loved it, loved it, loved it. Well, you look- And I loved that event. It was a very fun event. <laughs> you look really happy in this photograph, seriously. <laughs> definitely the more photogenic <laughs> of the two of us um she also has the she is more outgoing for sure whereas I get embarrassed when people are taking pictures I try to pretend they're not there um but she's a hoot and a half for sure Yeah, my scribal. I really like doing scribal. It's, it's, I mean, it's similar to putting garb together, right? There's a finished product and knowing that it's going to someone and hoping that they appreciate it is, is great. This is one of those last minute, like we need to have a charter now. Um, but it was, it was a good time. Wow. I think that was my second or third Bergamel's. Um, and I can't remember, there were, <laughs> I can't remember who was talking, but it was just, I couldn't leave. I was supposed to go back to the camp and I just had to stand there and listen to the conversation because it was so hilarious. Uh, <laughs> and I didn't see that picture until someone posted it. I didn't know my picture had been taken, which is a little awkward to see it then posted, but <laughs> good times. It's but, beautiful. But yeah, your face is so relaxed, probably because you don't know you're being photographed. <laughs> probably. <laughs> I don't even remember that event, but oh my gosh. Like, oh my God, I love that. 
it's too much. So, so Lynn is a huge Star Wars fan. Like, I had maybe watched bits and pieces of some of them. I now can quote some of the movies, some of the originals. She won't talk about the other three. Um, but that that was a fun time. And she's wearing one of my favorite garbs. So Celeste, or, or Shoxi, the step-up garb that you made for her is one of my favorite pieces. The other p- favorite piece is this, um, and it was made by Celeste. Dame Megan. Um, what? Dame Megan is her yes. Thank you. I, you know, this is, this is what I'm talking about. Two names. Yep. Um, and she looks great in blue. So I really, and that's one of her favorite, that and the step up garb. Yeah. But that stormtrooper, man. Awesome. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I was just like, what is happening? <laughs> this is one of my favorites that you have. Um, this is when I believe at their step down. And she was giving me the Baroness favor. So there were, I mean, there, so there's a lot of things, you know, when you're, um, a partner or sitting as Baron and Baroness um, that you you don't want to show favorites. You don't want to, you know, um, you want to make sure everybody feels included and not, you know, gifting things to your significant other. So she gave me the Baroness favor as I believe that was her, her step down. That or maybe it was, no, it wasn't because I wasn't wearing that. Um, but it was an amazing moment to have her talk about the the time that we spent together and, and recognize how much work I did behind the scenes for her and the barony. Very special moment. So, oh my gosh, this was their step down. Um, you know, I, it was already an emotional day because she was getting, well, okay. I'm not going to lie. Like I was so happy. I was ready for her to turn in the crown, but it was an emotional day. It was an emotional day for her and the long journey that we'd had the ups and downs and scrambles and going from an event to an event, um, was coming to a close and, you know, her and Baron Whalen did a lot for the barony. I really thought that they were amazing and really set the tone for a wonderful reign. So the event that I stepped down, for some reason, got all of these awards at once. So I got called up, Shay called me up, and I remember going up there going like, it's a queen's favor, but I have a queen's favor. What could this possibly be? <laughs> and I actually, I had a tear or two. I was not expecting it at all. I didn't really know anything about court baronies at that time. Lynn had had kept it a secret, which I don't know how she did because we can't keep presents a secret um, and had a temporary uh, cornet made by um, Sigmund, Master Sigmund. And they called me up and I was like, I, I this is amazing. This is, <laughs> and, and she said it was all for, you know, the DEI work. And then I got a, an award from the principality for service. And the, our current Baron and Baroness gave me two awards um, that couldn't be given in Lindis's reign, of course. And so they uh, acknowledged. So it was a huge day. I don't particularly like going up in front of people. Like, it makes me feel anxious. And it was a lot. It was, it was overwhelming, but I really, it was so amazing. And my court, so the, the charter for the court barony, um, was made by oh, CSCA names. 
Say the say the Moon Vega. Uh, Moon Vega. Wow. And it is amazing. So it's it's so personalized. The there's a poem on there about a cat and an owl. And my symbol, my um um device. Is, my device. See, this is what happens. Uh, my device is owls because I'm, I love owls. And so she put in a story about owls and cats because I love cats. And she did it in such a manner that she silhouetted the words around an owl and a cat. And it was so beautifully done and so touching. It is one of, if not my favorite charter, it's just amazing and beautiful and so personal. And she's someone I really look up to for scribal work. Um, she's what I would aspire to be just a little bit of even. So that, that was really meaningful for me and a really touching moment. That's awesome. Super cool. Yeah. It was just a lot that day. It is a lot. And then we have just the fun times, right? Uh, doing some shots with the group. (laughs) That's got to be supported kings, right? Yeah. Yeah. Some of my favorite times are are in there. Yeah. She makes me very happy. And there's Tara Pomeria. I mean, such a lovely, wonderful group of people. So kind-hearted and welcoming. It really, like I said, again, their, their welcoming was what helped me find peace in rough times and they're so supportive and just I mean when I say kind like they will give you the clothes off their back they're just amazing people and we're small people and uh I like to call us the uh land of misfit toys um (laughs) you know we have just a wide variety of people and a lot of social anxiety, but so amazing in so many different ways. That's, that's it. And it's not a lot of pictures because you've only been playing in the SCA for five years, six years. Do we count this year? You've been working yeah, you've been working hard this year, so we're totally counting this year. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I hope so. <laughs> Only six years, but six years is a long time. Like, that's, you know, that's invested. Yeah. It, it feels, it definitely feels like longer sometimes, but I have so much more to learn. I have so much more that I want to do and so much more just help that I want to bring into it. Um, you know, again, I am a counselor by profession and it's what I love to do. And I'm trained in trauma informed and DEI and all of these things that I can bring in and make applicable to the SCA work. Um, like I said earlier, I'm not sure that my Laurel, (laughs) my Laurel is very supportive. So is very supportive of me, uh, she would probably like to see me do some more Laurel work and I'm sure I will get back to that. But right now, like, I think this is needed. I think that if, if people keep requesting it, I'm going to do it. We're going to make it happen. And, and knowing Suvia and her, uh, her passion for activism, um, I'm, I'm sure she is so proud of the work that you're doing and so 100% behind, uh, everything that you're doing right now so yeah, I tried to call her and I'm like there's this thing I'm not sure what to do about it because right now I'm ps <laughs> so can you talk me through this um and I have a lot of great support systems um you know Nadezhda has been very helpful in helping me learn about running events there's just so many amazing people I've been really fortunate to meet and have just resources up the wazoo should I need anything just just fantastic awesome awesome um Rifkin are there any other questions that you had that you wanted to talk about tonight I don't think so 
Jean-Bierre, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you wanted to cover tonight? No, I think that, you know, so again, I have the class in Avacol and I'll send out a link. I will have the train the trainer and I should probably send out another link um, so people can sign up. And then, you know, Voices of Color, as soon as, as soon as I can, we're going to launch the website and July 6th, we're rolling. So okay. I think right now that's, that's my focus. Um, Rifkin put the, the link up for the Train the Trainer and you taught a class through Terra Primaria, is that correct? I have taught five or six classes across the known world. Okay. so. Uh, we'll see if we can find some of those links and, and link those classes so people can watch them because they're, they've been recorded and they're on, you know, so they're, they're totally accessible. Um, so I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, Voices of Color and I'm super excited about that. Um, I have one more week of uh, a branch of laurels. Uh, next week is the last week and um, I am super excited and I feel very honored that Her Majesty on tier has agreed to um, be my last Laurel interview. So that will be next Tuesday. That's fantastic. You also does scribal stuff? <laughs> yes. That's what I heard. Again, so many people to learn from. And it's wonderful. I guess uh, Sunday. Thank you. I'm, yeah. Sunday, I'm talking to Duke Tiernan about Kit Profile. And next Wednesday, we're talking to Sir Cohen from um, Artemisia. Um, She's the first woman knighted by the kingdom of Artemisia. Sir Leah also lives there, but she was knighted in Aintonville. And so that should, and she's um, older. She got knighted after she turned 50. Um, so that should be really interesting to talk to her too. And she's one of my favorite people. So. Yeah. Thank you. I love to see diversity like that, right? Communities that often are um, underrepresented. That's fantastic. So many things. Love it. So really appreciate so the work y'all have done. It's been a pleasure. Rifkin, what were you going to say? I just, I was thanking her for her time and for being so candid with us and uh, talking about difficult things. Um, I, I just really appreciate um, the emotional work that goes into that. Um, and I just want you to know that, that it is appreciated. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to come on here and get on my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I too am thankful. Thank you very much for, for agreeing to do this. And uh, I'm super looking forward to uh, having you take over Tuesdays. <laughs> <laughs> On a lot of levels. <laughs> All right, um, everybody, thanks so much for watching tonight. And uh, we'll see you soon. Stay safe.